Now let us continue our worship this morning with this first scripture lesson from 1 Kings 19, 1 through 9. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life like the, like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly, an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank, and then he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Here ends the first scripture lesson. Be thirsty. This is indeed the will of my Father, that all who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. Then the Jews began to complain about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me. I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be... and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The word of the Lord. On Misson's trip, I employed a tactic to quickly break the silence that happened at the beginning of the trip as we were all getting used to, to each other or after a long day of work, or as everybody's eyes suddenly gravitated towards their phones. And it was asking a somewhat ridiculous question, quickly followed with a demanding response, or, or asked quickly so that I get a quick response. Here's some examples. Dean, tell me your favorite dinosaur and why. Go. Linda. Would you rather fight a bear-sized chicken or ten chicken-sized bears? Go. Gary, is a hot dog a sandwich, a hoagie, an open face sandwich, or something else? Go. And then I watched as they panicked and scrambled to put together an answer. I picked it up from a friend of mine who was a youth leader, and he would ask these large, complex, or crazy questions, and then say, go, right at the end. And he always felt a little bit awkward, but that was part of it. And everybody just like laughed how everybody just felt awkward. We were all the same. And we replied to these questions with laughter, quick answers, funny explanations, and an opportunity to connect with one another. So church, what is the most neglected commandment by followers of God of the Bible, and yet the most socially acceptable by Christians to neglect? Go. Did you think of one? Did anyone think of remember the Sabbath and keep it holy? Hands? 
I saw, oh, I saw a couple. Nice. Okay. Very good. Remembering the Sabbath would not be the answer that I would think of if somebody said, go, right at the end of that question. And I would not think of it right away, and there's no way to tell what the correct answer is, right? But all I know is that as a pastor, I struggle with remembering the Sabbath. Obviously, I make it to church every Sunday. You all know that, okay? But it can be difficult for me to enjoy the rest that I'm meant to receive on the Sabbath, on a Sunday, when I have to provide and and lead the worship on a Sunday morning. And it kind of makes things difficult. And after church, I may go home and take a nap. We may go see friends or relatives. But mostly, Sunday becomes like any other day for us. And I don't think it would really change all that much if I wasn't a pastor. And if I was just attending another church on a Sunday morning, I would still probably have Sunday turn into a day like any other day. And because whether we like it or not, we're steeped in a culture of productivity. It feels wrong to rest on most days. We feel weird for taking the time for reflection, prayer, and reading at any other point than the very beginning or very end of our day. And if we work Monday to Friday, or even more, Sundays are not a day off that we want guidelines for. It's not a day off that we want rules attached to. And if we're retired, then we want our days to be filled with activities and trips and visits and quality time with loved ones. So, even when we have long periods of time, like what many of us experienced during the COVID shutdown or when we were self-quarantining, I'm sure that we still struggled with developing Sabbath practice. At the beginning of the shutdown, I, of course, nerdy as I am, thought that I would get through my most weighty theological books that I had just purchased to be in a, their own subsection of my library. I mean, this was an obsession. I searched for these once. And I was all excited, but I started with a philosopher that was, well, way over my head, and I stopped after book one. And so, suddenly, even though I had all this free time, and, and I could understand the philosopher, it was just slow reading. Because maybe it's not about whether we have the time, but about whether we make the time, or whether God shows up to remind you that you need to spend some time with him. Today we're going to be talking about the Sabbath rest, relying on Christ to sustain us, and about having a new direction from productivity to reliance. Let's take a look at 1 Kings 19, 1 through 9 this morning. And as you turn there, I encourage always in your Bibles, because you can see what's around it, but as you turn there, I want to ask you a sincere question about how you have managed your rest. Have you all ever been so busy, so stressed, that you're forced to rest? It's not an option. You're forced. Those moments when you've been running on fumes, when you barely got any sleep the night before, or the night before that, and it just never seems like there's enough time in in the day and you sleep through your alarm, even if you never do that? Or what about those moments when you catch yourself falling asleep and nodding off in school, at work, or even when your eyelids just get really heavy behind the wheel and you convince yourself that just shutting them a little bit when you're at a red light is fine? Spoiler alert, it's not. Right? Right? But we panic when that happens, don't we? I scramble out of bed. I pull over to get some coffee. I splash water on my face or do whatever I need to do to get back to what I was doing before, to what I desired to do. My body demanded rest, but my mind always seems to say, just a little bit longer. Just give me a little bit more time. You all may have stories about periods in your life where you've had to work several jobs 
and you only had a few hours of sleep a night for a long period of time, and that's what you had to do to to, to survive and to provide. And I have my own stories to share, but I don't look back at them with pride. I look back at them and thank God that I didn't die falling asleep behind the wheel. I look back and I thank God that I survived those periods of my life. I hope nobody else has to go through them. Those times when I looked back and I ignored the need to rest. More than once on retreats for ministry leaders who are often fighting the urge to, um, to rest, continue to um, quit the ministry because of how much is demanded upon us, more than once on retreats like these, I have heard 1 Kings 19 being read and looked at used as a basis for one of the lessons about the need for rest for pastors and those in, the, in ministry. And so let's get into it, because it's also a message for you. In 1 Kings 19, we'll see the great prophet Elijah, who we know that name, we're familiar with that name, is seen fleeing the king and queen of Judah, Ahab and Jezebel, who were seeking to kill him, because why? Because he had killed all the prophets of Baal, the false god. And, and we need to pause here and ask, wait a minute, Elijah's a great guy, why would he do that? What happened? Go. Well, King Ahab married Jezebel, and they were both worshippers of another god named Baal. And because of the resistance that the prophets of Yahweh gave, Jezebel led, led the um, king and queen in putting down, in killing these prophets of Yahweh because there was political unrest, there was challenge on, on the God of Baal, and she wanted all these prophets of Yahweh dead. And so Elijah finally called, a, called for a duel, like the Old West. And he said, you know what? You're prophets against me. You got 450, but I just got me. Let's both build altars. We're going to put our sacrificial bull on there, and then we're not going to light a match. We're going to call for our God to light the fire. 450 prophets of Baal said, okay, well, I'm at a good, good advantage, so I'm going to do it. And they built their altar, they sacrificed the cow, they put it on the altar, and nothing happened. They prayed, and nothing happened. Baal did not respond. And Elijah, seeking to rub it in a little bit, called for a large amount of water to be poured over the altar. Now, I don't know about you, but I've tried to start many fires with wet wood, doesn't work very well. Doesn't work very well. And he not only wanted the wood wet, he wanted it saturated to the point where the water pooled at the bottom of the altar and, and turned into a trench. And basically he said, now watch this. And he called and God responded with a pillar of fire that instantly incinerated what was on the altar and evaporated the water that was there. After this event, Elijah being threatened by, for his own life and also being threatened for the spiritual state and future state of the people that he loved, called for these prophets of Baal to be killed. And so as a result, Jezebel was seeking his life. And now we're all caught up. Elijah ran about a day's journey into the wilderness and sat down under a tree wishing to die. Before, and before Jezebel caught, caught up with him. He wanted to die on his terms, not when Jezebel caught up. And if you're afraid, the last thing that you want to do is fall asleep. If somebody is chasing you, seeking to kill you, the last thing you want to do is fall asleep. But he was too tired. He was too exhausted. He was too worn out. See, his body demanded rest, and he couldn't even have the chance to refuse. And he was woken up by an angel of the Lord who said, get up and eat. And there was food prepared and there was water there. And he drank and he ate and fell asleep. And then he woke up again by the, by the angel touching him and saying, hey, Elijah, come on. Time to eat, time to drink. And Elijah gets up and does the same thing. And then that gave him the strength to go 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Horeb, the Mount of the Lord, where so many things have, were said to happen. 
And a message to gather from this text is this. You may be strung out, stressed out, about ready to give up, and think that your only option is to lay down, give up, and wave that flag of retreat. But what you don't know is the power of God that is able to meet you at your weakness, provide for you what you need, and call you to a purpose that you didn't see coming. See, we feel guilty for rest when we're leaders, when we're mentors, when we're teachers, parents, grandparents, and when we have anybody who looks to us for direction. But if Elijah didn't get some rest, he would not have been able to continue. He would have not been able to show us the goodness of God when the angel gave him that bread and water. He would not have been able to continue to confront evil in the kingdom of God, and he would not have been able to disciple Elisha to continue on in Elijah's calling. So next time you feel guilty about taking some rest, especially some physical rest that you need, that your body needs, or some spiritual rest that your soul needs, you better remind yourself that Elijah took the time to rest. So we have to not only have to learn to be okay with rest, but to know that rest is an integral part of our progression in doing what we are called to do. Continuing on in John 6, which we've been on in for the past couple of weeks, looking at John 6, we're going to be looking at the eternal rest that Christ provides, that Christ offers to us. We already heard about the feeding of the 5,000, walking on water, and the challenge of Christ in telling the people, no, don't follow me because of what I give you. Follow me because I am God. Follow me because I am the way. After this, he tells them, and he continues on this imagery, that he has what will truly sustain them that he has the bread of life. Think back to Exodus, from the Exodus from Egypt. And after the people crossed the Red Sea, they were crying out for food and water, and God provided them uh, uh, quail, sorry, manna, and water that was bursting forth from a rock. Jesus leading the people out of spiritual bondage is saying, that he is the bread of life, and we also know elsewhere that he also calls himself the living water. Looking at verse 40 of John chapter 6, it says, This is indeed the will of my Father, that all who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. Jesus said that the will of the Father, the will of Yahweh, the same God who Elijah followed, the same God who provided that manna and that quail, was for all who who see the Son and believe in him. And therefore, Christ is the way to have eternal life. And the people struggled here. They asked, isn't this the son of Mary and Joseph? Don't we know his parents? We know where he came from. How can he say that he's from heaven? And that same question is asked today, isn't it? See, we have a fair amount of evidence to say that Jesus of Nazareth was a real historical person. And yet people are still asking, was Jesus even real? And they're still debating on whether or not he rose from the dead, whether or not he's God. But Jesus says again in John 6, 47 to 51, and I'll summarize Whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life, but not like the manna that the people ate and then they died. No, if you eat this bread, you will live forever. And Jesus said that he would give up his life so that we could have this everlasting life. Now, I want us to think about that Last Supper. I want us to picture Jesus washing the disciples' feet. I want us to think of those words, this is my body that is broken for you as Christ broke the bread, and this is the blood of the new covenant that is shed for you as he passed the cup. Those disciples could have done so much more in their last evening with Jesus than have that meal. Jesus could have preached to so many more people, especially on Passover. But instead, in the midst of stress, busy times, and chaos, 
they took the time to have a Passover meal together, to reflect on God leading the people out of slavery, and to start a new religious tradition together, reflecting on God the Son leading the people out of spiritual bondage, because Jesus is the bread of life that sustains them. When the manna came, the people were instructed to only take what they needed to eat because they were waiting for new manna every day, and that was an act of faith in relying on the faithfulness of God. God wants us to have a change of direction from productivity to reliance. So too, we gather on the Sabbath on Sunday, recognizing that we could be doing anything else. We could be out shopping, running our errands, but we gather to wait on the goodness and faithfulness of God that we know will fill us and sustain us, and that will provide us the rest that we need in order to move forward in the path and way of Jesus now and in the life to come. Because when I feel like giving up, because I am faced with my imperfections, my sins, my fatigue, and my witness, I need a reminder that when Christ was arrested, he didn't give up on us. When I feel like this world is beating me up and it's a struggle to stand on my own two feet, I need a reminder that when Christ was betrayed, as he was getting beaten and whipped, that he not only understands my suffering, but that he endured the suffering for my sake and all of those that I struggled to love. When I feel ashamed and stripped of dignity and humiliated, I need a reminder that Christ endured the carrying of the cross on the Via Della Rosa and was nailed to the cross and rose up to be mocked at Calvary in order to point us to a heaven and a better way. When I feel lost and broken down, unimportant, good for nothing, dead in sin and irredeemable, I need a reminder that Christ died on the cross for my sake, for my sin, and for yours, and is extending his hands with the bread of life that can only come from him to those who believe. Because when I am frozen and locked in the tomb of hopelessness, I need a reminder that Christ broke out of that tomb, defeated death, and showed me that and the world that he wasn't lying. He really did die for the least of these, for you and for me. We all really are worth dying for. Yes, I need a reminder that my God is not dead because he is surely alive and that by leaving what Christ has done and in who Jesus is, I am promised eternal enriching life now and in the life to come. Because as good of a person as I think I am sometimes, I also know the sin within myself that I am called to surrender daily. Because I cannot achieve salvation on my own. It is only through the person, work, will, sacrifice, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is only through that. It is only through the gospel, that good news, that he welcomes all people at all times to call out to him, to believe in him, and that his grace will save us all. That is why we need to be people who take the Sabbath seriously, because I don't know about you, But I need a reminder of these things. I truly and deeply need those reminders. I need to have a change of direction from productivity to reliance. And maybe that looks like more time reading and listening to the scriptures. Maybe it means more time in prayer. Maybe it means more time reflecting on the goodness of God from the vantage point of my favorite places to be. Or maybe it just means taking the time to sleep and thanking the good Lord for rest. But it doesn't just mean a service on a Sunday morning. It doesn't just mean restaurants and stores that are closed on Sunday. It means a time set apart for surrender and a willingness to await direction. Church, may we all take the Sabbath seriously, because we all need the reminder that we cannot outgood ourselves into heaven. We can only get there through Jesus Christ. So let me ask you, when's the last time that you took time to go meet with God? And by meet with God, I mean take the time to realize that God is already with you. 
Or when was the last time that, like Elijah, you were giving up and spent and God met you and confronted you with your need to rely on him? May we think about that and pray about that. And may we be ushered into those blessed times of rest, even in the midst of stress and chaos, when we could be doing anything else. And if you have not decided to follow Jesus yet, to believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that his life, ministry, cross, and resurrection invites you to know the embrace of the Father and then be filled by the Holy Spirit, I pray that you know that the hand that is extended towards you, offering you the bread of life, will never run out, will never go bad, and that it will sustain you not only in the journey through this life, but offers you life that extends long after our death into the eternal life to come and into the eternal kingdom of God to come on earth. May we all repent and believe and know our need for the kind of rest that only Jesus provides. May we all change our direction from obsession with the things of this world and productivity to reliance on God. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for the message of your gospel, that you love us, that you came for us, that you taught us and lived with us and died for us and rose for us, welcoming us in to your presence, to your kingdom, feeding us with bread that will never let us be unsatisfied, giving us water that will always quench our thirst. Lord, I pray that all of us grow to become closer to you and that those who need to reach out to you in prayer can do so knowing that your hand is already extended, your embrace is already waiting. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray.